Jeff Warren, Lisa Keynes, uh, Tim Freak, and Gary Weber. Thank you. Okay. So I think I'm supposed to be the moderator, so maybe I'll start it off. Um, uh, I just gave a talk about uh, trying to describe non-dual experience from different point of, points of view and what it might look like to be really honest about some of the details that maybe we don't hear about all the time. Um, and, you know, the challenges, the surprises, the different w ways in which it's embodied. Um, so I thought maybe by, um, oh, as a way of starting, just each one of you might just talk a little bit about um, your own, ex you know, your own story of how you got to where you are now. I know that's a huge story, but, you know, maybe focusing on um, the shift in perspective, uh, what, what that felt like for you, what it felt like before, what it felt like after, um, and any comments about that, and then we can kind of begin to go in and, and, and uh, move out from there. So anyone, maybe we'll start with, who wants to start? Well, we start in the middle here with Tim. Okay. All right. Uh, the journey for me really is spontaneous experience of what I now call being deep awake when I was 12 years old, looking around at all the adults, confused that no one else seemed to see that they were in this incredible mystery, and everyone else was acting as if they knew what it was. I still have this. And yet, it felt to me no one knew what it was. Not my teachers, not my parents, not people I knew. There was this profound mystery happening and no one was acknowledging it. And for whatever reason, something happened one day just sitting on a hill and woo, my state changed and there was this, I would now say oneness, at the time, love. Just that, like, and the film which was played earlier was really an attempt to capture that movement from uh, to oh. And my life has been a journey of exploring that movement uh, and constant transformation so that there's just too many to talk about. So that my expectation is it just goes on. I hope it just goes on and on and on to my last breath and maybe even beyond. Okay. And the, the next big change, which may be worth mentioning in this context, was arriving in my 30s, early 30s, much later having done every mad thing I could and starting to write lots of books, and encountering a really strong form of non-duality and being catapulted into that, from that into this profound sense of this state which we've been exploring. I won't say much about it because I think everyone else has. And feeling like at that moment, this is it. And, and also a sense that people who didn't get that this is it were kind of wasting their time. And we're still in that, still in the personal, still caught up in not seeing this huge thing which I could now, which, which was being seen. Uh, from which I'm extremely glad to say I was rescued. And in part, not totally, but in part I was rescued by having a child. Because suddenly this mattered. Suddenly my attachments were very real and the personal became and the body and just became of such delight and challenge. And that's left me now, some time later, with this sense, which I hope I've been able to try and articulate at this conference, that there's a deep paradox here in this moment. And it's not either this or this, it's both this and this. And the non-duality is when there's both. And so what I'm exploring and what I hope to carry on exploring and c continually go deeper into is how can I be conscious, what I call paralogically conscious of both, to go deeper into that oneness and to embody it more in this very frail, very ordinary human being called Tim, who's on this amazing journey in which one minute he'll be lifted up, another minute he can be thrown down, one minute he can be walking through the dark woods, another day he can be lying by the pool, and that journey isn't linear. It's not like, if, it's all, you know, if I'm having a good time, it's good, well done Tim, you've succeeded. It's not like that. It's actually a journey in which you never know what's around the next corner. And that that's happening here, and then here there's this acceptance and this love just as it is, and mystery, and I have no idea. So here I have no idea, here it's a story, and they're both there at the same time. Here it's impersonal, here it's intensely personal at the same time. Okay, well I want to drill into that in a bit, but first of all, maybe go to Gary. How, what, so what's your experience, or what was your kind of journey in? Well for me it was um, my late 20s, back in graduate school, uh, epiphanous moment walking towards campus and discovering that all of my suffering uh, was illogical. I mean, my body was healthy, wife, two kids, 
Um, and yet I was suffering enormously. And as I could ascertain, it was all caused by my self-referential thoughts, which I call blah, blah. And so I didn't know anybody who had even looked at this before as a problem. But being an empirical scientist, I decided to set out and see if I could get at this DIY, uh, somehow doing it myself and trying to understand it. So I tried a bunch of personal things of all sorts to try to understand what thoughts were. Got into Zen, came across the teachings of Ramana Maharshi, which were very important to me, and a 14th century Japanese Zen monk called Basui, who was very similar, and they all taught the same approach. What am I, where am I, who hears, what is this? Trying to unravel the self-referential narrative. And after a lot of doing this, uh, one day, doing an asana flow, I went up into it one way, and page turned, and just like a leaf, uh, my thoughts stopped. And they've been basically stopped now for 14 years. Uh, there are, uh, there's no uh, change in functionality. There is just this deep, still uh, presence, sweet, deep, still presence. Okay, so I want to come back to that again, also the thoughts, but why don't we go to Lisa for... Uh... Uh, so, seemingly there was an intense spiritual search, but whether that's the result of this moment, I don't know. <laughs> really? <laughs> so, there was lots of teachers and seeking and suffering and seemingly, and then one moment it seems that that stopped, but then it, it's this, and how do we really know? I could put together any story I like. I could tell you about when I was a child and I was dyslexic and all there was was this. Or I could tell you all these different stories and piece them together and make a nice little beautiful flowing thing. But I don't know. I'll just know this really, which is quite funny. There's all these faces looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> we had we chatted a little bit before, and and you were and you said something really really interesting to me. We were talking about uh, about how about desiring to help people, and you were saying that that it it's a little different for you now. And can you, do you want to say a little bit about that? Because I think that would be really interesting for people to hear that the way you experience that is kind of different than it used to be. So in the past, it seems that there was a lot of suffering. And when I looked at other people, that was what I saw. And so the dynamic here was always to help people because this body-mind mechanism was suffering. What I tried to always do was help other people that were suffering, particularly animals. And so it was this big hole saving people's journey and this big hole... Um, trying to rescue people. And then there came a point where I was with my boyfriend and I was looking at dead meat or meat in the butcher shop and I was like, ugh, that's disgusting. And he was like, all you see is your own death. And it just became this moment where now it's like this whole idea of helping people. Who's trying to help who? Who is it that you see out there? Who is it that we ever see? Just a story that we think is us, but then we project it onto other body and mind mechanisms. <laughs> And then we're, no, we've got to save them. Me, them, me. I don't know. But what was in interesting, you said too, that when you're no longer attached to try helping people like that, you, you're actually more effective yeah. in the end at helping people. It, have, it, it seems to be. Because <laughs> in situations of panic, it seems to be that way because you're not projecting onto whatever you're helping, your whole story or anything, but who knows? Right, so you really have no sense of, uh, there's a Lisa doing something in here. There's a doer controlling experience. You don't have that feeling. There's just life happening. There's just life happening. Does that sound, can you guys relate to that sentiment, that sense that there's no agent in here doing something, just, that your life just happening? Is that how it feels? Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that's something we talked about kind of yesterday, okay. was you know, this idea of the Buddhist being compassionate. I, mean, I, have, I have no sense of compassion. I mean, you're just fully, as Lisa was saying, fully present. And if you're fully present, then something comes out of that that is of a whole different character. I mean, much more appropriate, creative than anything I could have mentated, thought up as how it should look like or what some book said it should be like. Hmm. You're actually much more useful and it's much more efficacious to just be fully present right now with what's happening. And are you surprised when an action then comes out of that? Are you surprised by your own actions ever? I mean, they're always much better than I could have thought up. So there is a surprise then. Yeah, and, and, and the, the thing of, of uh, like I talk about business meetings, you go into business meetings and the same thing happens, 
is, is you, you get something that comes up that is so much smarter than I am. It just comes out of no place, and you just, after a while, learn to understand it. In fact, you're not running the show. No, you're not running it, but you're doing a very poor job of it. So you just get out of the way and just let a much, much better answer come out, whether it's helping, quote, helping people or being in a business meeting. Interesting. Does that sound relate to that? Can you relate to that, Tim? Or? I'm, I think all I need to say is um, that if you have if th this perspective, which I've arrived at, of seeing the constant paradox of our predicament leads me often to be the one who's always saying the opposite, but not because I disagree. So I usually find myself around people who think they know what life is, and I'm the one going, yeah, me too, and can you see it's a total mystery as well? Here, I'm around people who are <laughs> saying, it's a mystery and it's all one, and I'm the one going, yeah, and can you see that it's just personal and us as well? and that there is all of that normal interchange going on. So I'm finding myself in this particular environment because there's this, it's, everyone's got this. I'm the one going, yeah, and, and this. Whereas normally, when I'm going out, I'm the, the people are going, there's this. I'm going, yeah, and this. Mm -hmm. And so the, the beauty of it is that I agree, and the, the downside of it is that I'm always wanting to add the opposite because I think they sit together. And when we right. deny one, it's like the wave and the particle. So you're, it's you're not attached, just a wave, you're it's still not attached just attached to the idea that you're attached to the idea that it's both. I think attachment is part of being human. Mm -hmm. okay. And I don't have a problem with that. You see, attachment, you if you use the word as a bad word, I don't right. hear it like that. Yeah, I'm fully attached. I'm, I have no problem with it. I'm attached when, when, when I had my daughter, <laughs> yeah. that's where I saw I was attached and right. no one was going to tell me I shouldn't be. Right. And I wasn't going to play that game anymore. And just because I'd read it in books and heard it from people okay. with a nander at the end of their name didn't make it true. <laughs> right. Okay. What I had to do was look into my own experience yeah. okay. and see what was true. Well, let's start, talk with then to, to Lisa and Gary for a moment. How did, if you, if you, you don't have to go into personal details, but um, let's go into personal details. I mean, did it, how did it af affect your relationships? Like, um, how did you, you, can we talk a little bit about it? Because we talked a little bit about it before. Yeah. Uh, uh, start with Lisa, maybe. Like um, your romantic relationships, um, or I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> just it just does what it does. Right, but you um, uh, do you uh, hmm, do you still <laughs> feel as attached in romantic relations, or if you're in a relationship with somebody who likes you, you who's still attached in some way, and you're not? Does that make it? I mean, maybe for you it's not strange because it's just what's arising. But has yeah. it has it created any kind of? How does it feel for him or her? But also, I find all of this confusing. Wow, this is loud. Mm. I find all of this confusing because I don't really know. Like, whatever you tell is just a story. Like, how, like, mm. it's okay, we could tell a story, and there's no, I don't have issues with telling stories. There's love, I love watching films, and, but it's like, I could tell the story of, oh, this has changed, or I could tell, or well, there could be a telling of the story of um, comparison to before. It doesn't really matter. Okay. Like it's just, it's you could just tell from different perspective in a different mood with a different sensation, a different perspective will be told, and it's just doesn't really. It just doesn't really make sense. Like the relation, how's the relationship changed? It's like, well. So one thing that's changed is your um, ability to describe what's happening to you in a moment, moment to because moment is a little the, different. The thing is, is was it ever true what everybody, <laughs> was it ever true what everybody yeah. was saying? Like, so you tell, so if we tell a story, okay, so we tell a story of, okay, so five years ago I had this type of relationship and now I have this type of relationship. Do we really know that? Like, it's just a story and it's not wrong, but we can't even really remember. We remember fragments depending on the mood, depending on who we're telling, depending mm -hmm. on how we want to be, um, perceived by all these people looking at us, depending on if we want to get on with everyone else or get Gary's attention. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, Gary. <laughs> like, it just, it's a, and there's nothing wrong with it. Like, telling stories is great fun, and I'll go home and be like, oh, I have my, my um, picture taken with Liam Neeson this weekend. <laughs> and my mum will be like, yeah! <laughs> Liam Neeson went <laughs> Yeah, but like, I had no attachment about it, though. But it's, like, how, how can we sit by anything, really? 
But can you really remember those relationships and then this relationship now? All we ever know is this. Everything else is just mystery. And I don't have problems with stories. Stories arise. But comparison and then constantly living like, oh, this is what I'm like and this is how I'm relating with him and this is how he's relating to me and, oh, yes, we're a really good match and our star signs meet and whatever. We don't really know. We just know this. That's it. And then everything else is quite mysterious. This is the function of what the mind's always doing, trying to put together all these linear stories to make one overall big dramatic film. We don't know. Gary? Yeah, I think one of the big surprises to people I work with and myself fairly consistently is that things like sexual drive, sex, sexual drive falls away. Yeah, I've heard that. And it really does dramatically change. Because in the past, what you had was... Just like less and less you said sex, so we started giggling. It. Sex. <laughs> it was just like the way that you just uh, went into it. <laughs> it was it's awesome. The thing is, the sexual drive <laughs> was very good. Is, is it falls away for many people, and, and, and I try not to script this in, and I just see as they progress along how, how it's going to go. But you find out that a lot of sex, for example, is mentally driven. It's, you know, it's, it's mentated, it's massaged, it's thought upon, it's, it's amplified. And as you begin to lose your eye and your attachment, in fact, that falls away. It gets less and less prominent. The same thing happens with a lot of interactions with your close partner. If you've been, or any close relationship, I mean, you and the other person has come up with a series of ways in which you interact. And those can change. You've changed. And you don't respond in the same way you used to respond. This can be very difficult in a long-term relationship because, in fact, you, know, you aren't responding the way they're used to having you respond. And this becomes a very challenging thing. Many people I work with see the same thing as, difficulties in their relationships. I mean, they, many have go through a lot of stress in this way. Because the partner can't compete with this new state. You know, you're in some kind of a transcendent state they don't know, haven't experienced, can't compete with, can't understand, and you're spending more and more time there. So it can be very difficult for a relationship that way. So how did you work with that? In your relationship? Well, you, d you just try to be sensitive to what's, what's happening. You can see things are changing. You can see your sexual desires are changing. You can see your attachments are changing. You can see the way your relationships operate have changed. It, it all does, if, if you really let the eye fall away and there's nobody there to hold the other end of a lot of emotions, then those emotions really lose their potency and they really, the nature of them changes because there's no one to hold the other end of I need you, or I want you, or you know, I love you. There's nobody to hold the other end of that. And so it's just whatever it is, but it is not anchored in any kind of an agent that holds it. It's interesting. I've, um, I've heard that from quite a few people uh, who've told me that their drivers changed, the <laughs> things that really motivated them in some cases fell away, but then, I mean, one person telling me sex, art, like he was really motivated artist, he said it fell away, but then it came back in a different way. And that was something I found interesting. Like, he said, you know, they may fall away, but then they're, they kind of come back in this way that you don't expect. And I wonder if that, if you can relate, any of you guys can relate to that, if something fell away, but then, then but came back in a different way, or, or what else fell away? Now, how about we start with Tim? Uh, f yeah, things fall away and come back all the time. Mm -hmm. I think my, my journey is much less linear. Uh, and, I, it, and, and I find myself you know, sometimes feeling like maybe I'm coming to the wrong place because I, I, I certainly anymore, I, it doesn't sound attractive, this thing to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't want to lose my sex drive. Mm -hmm. I don't want my <laughs> wife to feel like I'm not holding the other end of our relationship. I don't, you know, I want... What's happening, I feel like I've, I've kind of been able to embody Tim more and learn a little bit of humility a bit and, and try and be honest. And, and but so, so what's changed in my relationships, I would say, yeah. is uh, I hope and I think, you need my wife here really to tell you, not me, um, that there's more authenticity. And what my hope is, like even when I meet you now, the, what I love, the, be, the thing I enjoy is when we can meet is all we are. So there's this huge infinite mystery of oneness, whatever you want to call it, looking through the eyes, meeting itself, but in two different forms. And these forms are delightfully limited and human and tender and vulnerable and flawed. 
And that's what makes them so delicious. And that's where we can get to know each other. But what, what is connecting is the one meeting itself as two. And when I meet people and I can be there authentically, one and two at the same time, there's this love, this deep, bittersweet love, which holds it all together. And that's the thing which I would aspire to find. And right. when I do, my relationships are at their best, whether with strangers or my lover or my kids or the well, dog. To, to me, the word that really the important way you just said is the bittersweet word. Yeah. And that, I mean, I think there is a desire. It seems like there's a desire on your part to want this to be a positive thing. And it may well have positive aspects. But what I'm hearing from uh, Gary and Lisa is that there are also things that are maybe not be necessarily what we would think of as positive. They, oh, uh, no. they, they're happening, and they're just they are they are what they I, are. I'm not. I'm not. I'm saying you don't the have opposite. To put a normative. No, no, no. I'm not for one. See, for me, the the, the like I talked <coughs> yesterday. My mum. Let's do that because my mum right now has got cancer. Just been diagnosed. I almost didn't come here. Just saying it. I can feel that attachment to my mum. I love her. I want to feel that. I would feel I'd lose something terribly valuable to my humanity if I lost that. I can almost, I can feel the emotion coming up into my eyes as I think about her. And there's a, there's a, there's a, a also this mystery, like you said, you know, who knows what that is. <laughs> and luckily my mum has that, so I'm, I can be there with it. And then it's bittersweet. It's like, it's, everything is what it is. And, ooh, yeah. right now. I understand. And, and, that, is, and it can, that, could, that ooh could turn into, ah, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to be able to go there and be with her suffering because she's suffering and she's my mum, mm -hmm. but not just in it, not so overwhelmed by it that I'm crushed. There's yeah. also this place where it's just, ah, oh. yeah. and they're both together. I understand. You know, it, it reminds me a little bit of something we talked about, Lisa, right before as well. Like We were talking about how you experience emotion, and you want to say a little bit about that? Uh, you said, um, well, actually, that's the other thing about the, <laughs> the forgetting thing too. You said that there's more forgetfulness now. Um, Did I? Yeah, you said sometimes there's more forgetfulness. <laughs> and then you said when you have an emotion, it's like you might feel sad, but then it kind of goes through you more yeah. quickly. Yeah, oh yeah, it's full on feeling. I'm right. not talking about removal from full feeling, but it, it just appears and disappears. So it's like if sadness arises, it appears and disappears. That's really consistent with um, my teacher, Shinzen, talks a lot about equanimity, that there's more fluidity, there's less fixating in the system. So you, you feel things more in some way, and, but then it goes through you more quickly. Um, but what seems to have fallen away is this storyteller that's constantly, I'm feeling this because they did that, and they're wrong, and so hmm. it's just sadness arises, and then it disappears, and, what, and joy arises, and then it disappears. They're just like every other form as well. People arise and then they disappear. So it's just like everything else. Everything comes and goes. That's the flow of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Gary? Yeah, and I, 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 I differ from both of these folks, obviously. I mean, it, 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 it really does change. I mean, it fundamentally changes. If there's no I sitting in there, uh, all of those self-referential, for me, when my self-referential thoughts fell away, self-referential desires fell away, self-referential fears fell away. I mean, my world fundamentally, absolutely, unequivocally changed. And it hasn't changed back. That's what non-duality means to me. That's how I experience it. That's my, how my life operates. Fears I had in the past just fell away. Mentated fears. I still don't step in front of buses. But the mentated fears just don't hang in there. The same thing with desires. There's just no mentated desires. They just don't arise. You can still recognize a form as something. You can see the rising of something, but it just doesn't go anyplace. And my life is fundamentally, dramatically changed. What about, is there, do you ever have an experience of fear? Is that, or they, is that completely gone? Fear seems to be gone. Hmm. I mean, it's especially, you know, the fear, like, I don't walk off cliffs. I walk to the edge of a cliff, I can, I can recognize I, I shouldn't step off this cliff. And so I step back from the cliff, I don't step in front of a bus. Mm -hmm. But as far as imagined fears, they like projected, oh, well, this is a dark place and you know, there's tigers over in the corner. That just doesn't, doesn't come up because there's no eye there to hold the fear. Mm -hmm. There's nobody to go out and grab the storyline and make something out of the fear. So here's a question for you. Was there anything that was surprising to you that when you found yourself in this place that didn't seem to fit up with what you had maybe read in spiritual texts? Oh, it was all surprising. It was all surprising. I mean, I, and I, I had practiced for, since they invented dirt, 
uh, till, this, till this happened. It took a long time. I wandered around in the dark and I was lost for much of my journey. Mm -hmm. But when it happened, it was like, whoa, this is, whoa. It was nothing like what I had expected because it was so much uh, deeper, more vast, more uh, still. I never expected this awesome, staggering stillness that gets deeper and deeper and deeper. I did not expect that. I did not expect to have my desires fall away. I didn't expect to have my fears fall away. I was told the thoughts would stop. I didn't think they would stop. I thought, <laughs> I thought they would like, you know, trickle down and we could have, but they stopped. There's still a few times during the day when I get very tired, my blood sugar gets very low. They can start up again. That's my best indicator that my blood sugar is low. But other than that, it's, it is really, quiet, very, very still. Okay, well here's a question for all you guys. Um, there are descriptions, you know, people describe shifts in their way of relating to the world, um, but there are also descriptions that are you know, almost getting on the more mystical end of things, where in this surrendering to things, it's like the world begins to change the way it relates to you. That, and this is the synchronicity piece, that things start to fall in line in a particular kind of way in a way that to a particular rational scientist might, who's not a quantum physicist, might think of as magical thinking, you know? But yet, it seems to suggest a kind of reciprocity. And so I'm just wondering if you've had, that, if you guys have had that experience, like all three of you, a sense of, as you've um, fully uh, opened to your, this state, the, the, there seems to be almost like a changing relationship to the, the world around you relates you, to you differently. Have you found that at all? Um, if there's not a storyteller, then how would you know that? Right. You just, it's just like life's just happening, and if there's not constantly this one reflecting and being right. separate from everything, then how would you know that? It's irrelevant. That's a good point. <laughs> well, it's, just, it's just life happening. So that's not something you've noticed. I mean, it may be happening, but you've just not made a story out of it. It's so. just not. It's not acknowledged. There's also lots of colours happening and lots of smells happening, and it's. But it's not acknowledged because there's not somebody keep telling the story of who I am. I have lots of synchronicities now. Look how better my life is. I'm. It, it's just not happening. There's just what's happening. I, you are the most amazingly unfixed position of human being I've ever met. It's interesting talking to you. What about you, Tim? No, no, I think it's like totally no fixed position, you know? It's like, which is, this is what you, you hear. You know, what, 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 I came across this thing in, in, in my kind of journey. It's not an answer to your question. Um, through being a dad, hmm. where I started asking myself, would I tell these non-dual teachings to my kids? That's Would I say, you're off to school, darling, don't think. Would I say, don't tell a story here, it's just colors. <laughs> Would I say, it's just mystery, you know nothing, and neither do I. Would I say, there's nothing to fear. When she says, Daddy, I love you, would I say, don't be attached. <laughs> what did you decide? I decided I wouldn't do any of those things. Here's my favorite. Here's my favorite. Would I say to my kids, or well, my son here is a good example, when he was on his Xbox, it's like, time for bed. And he's like, no, no, I'm in the moment. Would I go, it would just mean you're in the moment. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Do you stay in the moment, my boy? Don't let the bastards pull you out. No, I do the opposite of all of that. And what that left me with was this feeling, aha. Uh -huh. So we come in with all of that polarity. And then we grow into the world through thinking and conceptualizing and becoming more conscious and telling stories and having to work out what's the best story, which is, you know, it's like we've got lots of them and, and, and not being content and, and you come in and you learn and you think and all of these things and we arrive here and then we've lost that thing which we started with, which is going... <laughs> and then the journey comes, can I have that as well? But not instead, but as well, which is why this coming in wasn't a mistake. It was the thing to get you, that's the foundation from which you have this as well. And then you're a big grown up who can take care of your kids and you can meet them right in that moment and go, yeah, now, right now we can be in the moment. And it is just colored patches and woo, mystery. And they're both happening at once. And then you can carry on being functioning in the world as a, as a human being and going through the journey we're on 
and, you, and this is starting to emerge as well and getting stronger and stronger. And that beautiful description that you took us into a moment ago, which was just blowing me away, of just like, yeah, it just goes on, doesn't it? And this. And then you can bring up your kids to come and make the same journey. And that's what a life is. It's that journey. And the problem is a lot of people don't make the journey back. What's happening is you hit a certain point where you can make the journey back. Mm. And then you're, ooh. And that gets really interesting. Okay, well, let's come back to that, back that, to that in a second. Gary, what, you have kids. What, did, you, did it change the way you relate to them or what you said? Yeah, them? it did. I, 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 <laughs> my, my last big attachment, I, I was you know, letting go of attachments, was, ended up being my practice. That's what I really still teach. Mm -hmm. And they were, my two daughters were my last big attachments. And so letting go, not, of, not throwing them out, but you know, letting go of my being attached to them in a way that they belonged to me uh, was a big step, and I did that. And, and uh, I think they would say now that I'm probably a better father than I was before. We were very close, but, but now when, I, when I'm around them, with them, with my grandkids, I don't have a, an agenda, a storyline, a the place they have to be, something they have to do, a way they have to uh, control, comport themselves. It's just, it's very open and present and now. There's no place else to be, other, there's no place else the brain wants to be other than right here, right now. And so whatever manifests is, seems to be much more useful to them, and you don't know, than what it was before. Do you ever manifest giving advice to your grandkids in, in the way that uh, Tim was talking about? No, or? I don't. I mean, I, I, I really don't uh, give advice to anybody, even the people I work with. I, I'm, we very much meet right there. And uh, I don't charge anything for my teachings. And so we really do meet as, as one. It's, there's none of this going on. And we, we meet as just uh, whatever. Travelers on the path. That's that's too too judgmental into it. But we're just people sharing what what have you experienced and what have you experienced and what are you learning, and what problems have you had? Oh, I had that problem, and here's something you might think about doing there. Mm -hmm. uh, something I didn't have, and that's why it took me so long because I didn't have anybody to talk to. I just wandered around in the dark for a long time. Earlier, I asked about the synchronicity piece. I'm wondering for you, did you, was that uh, something you experienced? Well, I, I haven't stopped being, uh, not I being, but the imperial sci empirical scientist has still continued. I mean, I, I talk from science, I learn science, I repeat science. So I work with, I'm in five, subject in five studies. So I know a bunch of scientists, many of my students, maybe I work with are scientists. So, you know, I, I've kept that, that part, of it, part of it going on and it does appear as if, but it only appears as if, the universe does support this. I mean, I've told people many times, as I was coming up along the way, this long, long path, I really felt that, that each time I surrendered, something held me. And the more I surrendered, the more I was held. And when I surrendered totally, I was totally held. Very interesting, because what that suggests to me in some way, it's almost as if the world is slightly tilted towards somehow the positive, as opposed to it being totally neutral. There's something just inflected towards positivity or love in some way. And you often hear, I mean, I guess it's sort of like one of the big mysteries in the path is like, it, is that true? Is it the case that there is something holding us? Well, there are verses in the Bhagavad Gita, I won't quote Bhagavad Gita to people, but, but they're really, oh, I don't know, but I won't bother. But, but there is one, uh, there's a verse in Bhagavad Gita that's much talked about. Ananyas chintaya, and don't mommy, ajanas parupasatu, which says, as I surrender uh, something, I, I will take care of you. I will hold you. And it seems to be that way. Although it, it can be a storyline, it can be made up, but it sure felt like that to me, that I was being held every step of the way. How about you guys? Um, well, I don't think I would phrase it like that, but I would say that there was such a deep sense in the Lisa story of feeling abandoned and feeling separate from everything. 
And it really was never the case. And as that began to dissolve, there was always this aliveness, this beingness, this life that wasn't bounded. But it really seemed when the, there was this energy of personal there that someone had been rejected or somebody had been pushed out of heaven or something like that or pushed away from God or something or separate. And it was never the case. It always was beingness and it was always there. It's just the, there was the me dynamic or the personal dynamic was so loud, the sense of being separate. So that love, it was always that love which was looked for, or which was longed for, but it was just, it was, the focus was on the separation, the focus was on the separateness. So I don't know if, and as the me dynamic dissolves, it's always that same love, it's that same oneness. The love's a funny word because it makes people think it's a feeling, I don't know how to. <laughs> you guys are amazing, man. This is really freaking interesting TV. <laughs> Ten. <laughs> what was the question? Uh, feeling magic. Held, feeling held. Magic. Uh, held, synchronicities, magic, Anything. all of the above. Yeah. One of the things I oh, like. Synchronicity. Oh. I've got lost. <laughs> do you want to do synchronicity? No. <laughs> Go. One of the things about this is that I find that, you know, the, the, it, it, the image which comes to mind always for me to try and describe this is the, the dream, because you can see a dream, that in a dream you're in the dream and the dream's in you, and both are true at the same time. There's this place in which you're a separate partic participant in the, the story, and, you look, and there's another sense in which you are the whole thing, and there's no separateness, mm. and they're both true at the same time, and you, you can't prejudice one over the other, they're both real. And so when it's here, it's, it's very dreamlike, and then when it's here, there's this, I enjoy, a, there's a love affair between Tim and it. And here there's, it's just it, or it's just me, or it's just, there was no. So it kind of moves between the two. And one of the things I love about people like Rumi, when I was writing a book on Rumi, was I just loved this guy, because he was moving between the two the whole time. He was having a love affair, and he was the beloved. And he was having a love affair, and he, was, and he was dancing between these two. And he didn't care, he could just move, he was fluid. He could be here, he could be here. And then when it becomes like a dream, really clearly, it does, in my experience, often become more dreamlike. And synchronicity is a part of that, and there's a magic, and I've been having it here, and the right thing, and, the thing, and things fall on your head. And... But it's only sometimes, and then sometimes it doesn't. And then sometimes, the magic happens and it's really profound and then other times the magic happens and it's kind of silly and funny or ironic, ironic sometimes. And so the, the, the actual play of it is there, but it's almost like, like, like some hidden thing which you could find but never actually do, just like a dream. You know, it's, like it's got so many meanings, you could never pin it down and, and, and it's playing with you. And, and I, so there's this, this playfulness which comes out, although sometimes that's quite serious too. Oh dear. Did that convey anything? <laughs> it's sitting close to it you. Arose, this is, this it is. was an interesting <laughs> arising. <laughs> um, no, it's, I, 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 I like your, I like that your both and thing. I'm, I'm well, thank you. To it. Cool. <laughs> um, so Lisa talked about love, although a little bit different than, in it, it, not, not the feeling love you said, another quality of love. Uh, you know, the famous Zen, Zeni Dogen talked about intimacy with all beings, intimacy with all things. Is that, is that, uh, is, in, is intimacy as a word, is that, is that closer to that feeling or, uh, and I want to ask Gary as well. Yeah, but maybe beyond intimate. Maybe it's even more. <laughs> more intimate. <laughs> more intimate than that. It is like, I don't mean to, it's, to make this sound too special because, or too dramatic. It is this whole dream, although when it's taken personally, it doesn't feel like this. It is a love affair, but it feels... I know that when the me's there are telling the story of how awful it is, it doesn't feel like that. But it's like everything is, is the same. Everything is made of the same. And it's constantly... It's beyond intimate. It's like experiencing itself in all these different forms, but it's all the same thing. So it's 
even beyond the word intimacy, but how do we put it into words? We just then end up like... <laughs> <laughs> totally. That's what I feel like. Yeah, Gary? Yeah, a lot the same way. I mean, uh, if there's nobody here, then intimacy, the word intimacy doesn't mean anything. I mean, uh, my being intimate with something doesn't happen. There's nothing here to hold the other end of intimacy. And so what becomes then is it all becomes one thing. And as I said to the other, yesterday it was, I mean, I, I, really, I really see everybody as the divine. It really is, she's just dancing. Everybody here is just the divine dancing. And, and so it isn't like there's me different watching it. It's just she's just doing all the dances. She's the player. She's the actor. She writes the script. She's the conductor. She runs the play. She turns the lights on. She does everything. And so there isn't a question of you, you can't separate yourself enough to be intimate. Hmm. That's the, for me, that's the wrong word. So here's a question for you. Would you bring everyone to this place if you could? If we could understand if there was something happening in the brain that supports the state and we could figure out how to neurofeedbackly induce it with some you know, temporary lesion or a permanent lesion, would you bring everyone into that place? We talked about this at mm -hmm. breakfast this morning. Um, I, I, many people couldn't, can't hold it. And that's, that's not judgmental, that's, that's my experience. And so, uh, we've talked before, I mean, is you can develop powers to open people. And, if, and my experience is if you open people and they aren't ready for it, it doesn't help. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's confusing, it's disruptive, they don't understand it, they can't hold it, it creates you know, all kinds of things. And so, just let that go. And so I, I, I don't think it would be, and you'd like to say, okay, if you could all just come for a day and spend your time in my space and then go back again, um, would you be happier? Because if someone came to me and said, look, if you want, could you take the blue pill and go back? I think that would be really not okay. I mean, I, I, there's no, no even sense of ever wanting to go back to what it was before. I can't even conceive of doing that. This is so much better than anything I ever experienced before. But if you brought someone into it for one day and then they had to go back, that might be actually the cruelest thing you could do. And exactly, and that's, that's what I'm kind of wandering around into, is if you went back from this and couldn't get back here again, it might be a very cruel thing. Uh, so okay. so that, that's the other way to, to spin this thing. So if that's, given that this is the case, and given that you guys are operating from this place, this very human place, what would you say to everyone here who might want to get there, who might be suffering in their way? They're in their, they're in their and what, what can you say to them? I'm saying it's absolutely worth it. Go for it. Absolutely, you know, put all your chips on the table and there's nothing that'll touch this. I mean, put all your chips on the table, work as hard as you can, I know it's, you know, it's, it's you're doing, working, but there's nothing, you're not going to waste a second. I mean, this is really, really, totally worth it. What did you say, Tim? It would depend on the person, because what I find is, you know, first of all, I'm no oracle. I mean, I can only just, I would, you know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not a spiritual teacher. I hate that term. The word teacher, when linked to spirituality, somehow has a different meaning than linked to maths or English, you could be, in, you know, it's like a different, that's why I do the philosopher thing, be free from that. So, but if I'm with somebody and they, when we're, in dis we're talking and, and, and there's anything I can say to help, then I find it really depends. There's some people I want to bring right, I say, want to try coming down into this. Try connecting with your hum humanity. Try coming back into that vulnerable human place, that humility place. And then there's other people's where it feels like just relax there and just come right out into this spacious presence where you're holding the whole thing within you and nothing is separate from anything. And the place we want to go is to, to try and find as much of both as we can, because it's nice there. Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, well, slightly different topic, nature. Uh, I'm just curious about this because I've talked to people about 
um, about this, about as they go deeper into their practice, they're kind of like the relationship with nature starts to act differently. They have a different relationship with trees and animals and um, uh, more sensitivity to things that are going on around them. Now, that's maybe some people. I'm just wondering if that's been corroborated by anything in your experience or that just is for the, they just happen to be the nature mystic demographic I was talking to. Gary, anything? Yeah, trees are way cool. I mean, they, 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 there's, there's something about trees, but not just trees. I mean, all, all of nature feels, I mean, you, you can look out and see everything is, is her dancing, but you can, there's also an energy about it, like a vibration of some sort. You can, then it does feel so much more alive than it, than, as I can recall, it used to feel. I mean, everything is just, and it's like that all the time. You know, it's like being, a, I, I'm, a, I'm a complete virgin on psychedelics, so, so it, people have described it to me, you know, it's, like, it's like a trip. I mean, it really is a whole different perspective on nature. And nature really is, uh, it's also her dancing, but it's beautiful. It's awesome. I'm not really, I love nature, everybody loves nature. I go out, I get blown <laughs> away by it. It's not my thing, particularly when I'm persuaded to finally go out and look at it, I'm always amazed by how great it is, and then I quite like culture, and, yeah. but where I think I really can relate to what Gary was saying, and it's something which doesn't get mentioned enough, enough for me, is whatever it is I'm exploring, which may not be the same thing as what you're exploring, but when, it, if it really, if I have the chance to really open it up, it's incredibly pleasurable in the body. There's a real, like, to breathe. I'm getting it now while you were talking earlier. So come, the breath becomes like, ooh, kind of, my God, that feels good. Mm. Whoa, yeah. Just, you know what I mean? It's like, and then, ooh, that's good too. And, yeah, and, ooh, Tim, yeah. Look and, it's, and so there's a sensuality which gets missed out. I didn't find that in the bag of Vegeta or yeah. the Dao Te Ching. Yeah, your, or driver's the got, your driver's got turned around. No one boom. was going, this will feel really good. You know, and meditation isn't just about follow your breath, follow your breath. It's actually, my God, that's so good to breathe. <laughs> yeah. And right. that's, uh, so there's and That's the colors love and the yeah. So nature, that nature. <laughs> Sweet. Is that, is that can you relate to that, Lisa? Um. Oh, I forgot what the question was <laughs> about nature. Nature breathing, feeling good. Um. You know. This dog. is all nature. This is all it. <laughs> yeah. Trees. <laughs> yeah. Anyone got any questions out there? Right here. I have to say, uh, in relationship to the world, um, you know, half the planet lives on $2 a day. Mm -hmm. The global middle class live on 3000 to 5000 a year. 800 million people go to bed hungry. So it's, I, I, I'm practicing and I'm really immersed in wanting to be non-dual. And yet the Kali Yug is here. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Great question. Yeah. yeah but to, 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 for me, I, I think we have to get a new operating system. I think if we're going to get out of the Kali Yuga before, before our species is done, uh, we're going to have to get a new operating system. The one we have right now is 75,000 years old. Uh, I think it's time for an OS 2 or an OS 3. Uh, we, we can do it better. Uh, we don't have to completely get rid of this eye. We can use it as a thing off to the side. But I think we have to get out of an ego-motivated existence. We have to get rid of those ego-motivated desires. We're destroying the planet, and our species isn't going to make it much longer. So I think we have to do something dramatic. And I, I don't think this is escapism. I think it may be the way forward. Why? Because, because your, your, your ego-based desires, your need to exploit the environment, you need to have a, big, a giant car, a magnificent house, you know, six, six of this and ten of that, and all this pile of stuff in your... That goes, that goes away. Because you don't need those things anymore to make yourself feel okay. You're okay already. You're perfect already. And I think if we don't get something like that, we're going to be in a lot of trouble very fast. And you could also say you, it's easier to get out of your own way now to actually do something. Absolutely, about the and you problem. can do something. You can be really appropriate without some kind of story, some script coming into it. You're fully present for what has to be done to not have our species go away in about another hundred years. Tim, uh, I agree with Gary. I think we that's the, uh, that we do need 
a new way of being, and uh, hopefully that's coming through, and we're, what we're exploring here, I hope, is what that might be, and the different options for what that might be. I just want to, I really want, what came up for me was a, a quote which I love from the Gospel of Philip, a Gnostic Gospel, which I can relate to because it's very paralogical, um, which is about the gnosis, which is the, the, know, the knowing of this, um, and it says, those who are free because of gnosis become slaves because of love. And that's how it feels to me, that the more I feel free here, the more I'm compelled here. And the, the language for me of that paradoxity is that I'm loving being and then being loving. And that what I need to do is just is see that it's not just about self-realization, but it's also self-expression. That I have to not only know myself, but also be willing to show myself. And that means engaging with the world as it really is, with all of its suffering, in any way that I can, to... To, like that lovely quote that you had, it's all perfect, but it could be better. And, and that's the both. Yeah. Lisa, anything to add? Um, there could be lots said on the subject, really. <laughs> like, like, who... The biggest question always is, is who are you seeing out there? Who are you seeing... Suffering, and it's not to say that you don't give money to charities or we don't try and all have the same amount of food and the same amount of possessions. It's just always coming back to who are you seeing. So much time is sent, spent crying for other people when really it's the me crying for itself and projecting its suffering onto other people, projecting how it feels onto other people. But, I mean, what can we really say in three minutes or two minutes? Right. I think we're done. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you. You were fantastic. Yeah.